Great, man. How you doing? Yeah, good. I've just uh, uh, come back from booking collarbone. Oh no! Did it three weeks ago. Oh damn! So yeah, I did my last race of the year. Well, now it is. Now it's my last race of the year. But is that uh, Gas Town or Gaslight or whatever it was? No, uh, this was uh, GP Pue. Gas okay. Town was back in July. Yeah, back okay. in July. Yeah. So where are you right now? Girona. Okay. Yeah. And so you're there all year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty stuck here. Sweet. Well, so we usually just start rolling. So before we get yep. into people who don't know you, who give me the 30 second background. Who is Riley? Okay, so I'm Riley Pickerel. Uh this year I'm on Israel Permatech's development team. Uh and then I've signed for the next two years on Israel Permex Permatech Pro Conti team. Um Mostly a sprinter. Um, can get around some more punchy races, but mostly a sprinter. And uh, yeah, I think that's as far as the bike racing goes. That's my spiel. That's awesome. That was, uh, congrats on the contract. That's incredible. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, so I actually like how you say you're mostly a sprinter. We don't get too many people that are, you know, if we look, if people look you up on pro cycling stats, it's like Riley's a sprinter. And then people that probably saw you, from the States beat the Legion squad in Vancouver <laughs> at Gaslight. It's like, Oh man, this dude. Okay. Yeah. Pure sprinter. But how, so you, do you consider yourself, you say like you're mostly sprinter, but if it's punch, you can get to the end. Like what go in on that a little bit, because I think it's really interesting. You know, when people that aren't sprinters, we think of you guys as you only win a sprint, but that's probably not true. Like what's, what's the fine line there? Well, like, uh, in like days gone past, like 2015, 2016, you had guys like like Kittle. Mm -hmm. um, he was a sprinter, sprinter. You know, it was like if there was a, a motorway bridge, you're like, ah, oh, Kittle's not in the sprint today. <laughs> um, you know, so so he was like a sprinter back then. But now bike racing is starting earlier as far as like European pro road racing. Bike races open up earlier and race organizers don't like pan flat races to shell the uh to uh to the finish like shell the prizes mm -hmm. um so you need to be able to get over punch your stuff so you look at sprinters like like philipson or mm -hmm. uh caden groves like those guys can like can still do like six 6.1 watts per kilo for 15 to 20 minutes like oh yeah yeah like uh i had no idea uh, like groves in stage three of the zero Stage three of the year, I think. Groves won the sprint, and there was a hard climb before the before the finish, and he did like five point eight. So at the end of a race, he did like five point eight or six watts per kilo for fifteen minutes to get over that climb. Wow. Um, okay. To win the sprint. So yeah. So when you look at like sprinters now, people think like sprinters are, uh, especially like I've come from North America. I'm Canadian, um, so I remember when I was growing up. I looked at sprinters and I was like, oh, you just, you just ride around all day and then hit the sprint, but that's not the case anymore. Mm. Um, Have you always been like an explosive beast in sports? What other sports did you play growing up? Or when did you realize like, oh, I'm actually super just, ah. Um, I did ice hockey for the longest time. Okay. Six years, but I was terrible. Like uh, yeah. I was a good, I was just undisciplined. Like, <laughs> Like, I just didn't care. I would show up. I'd always do the, the practices and whatever. But, like, I never put any work into it. I come from, like, like my family was active, but they weren't high-performance athletes, you know? Mm. So I just played house hockey, like, just mm. recreational hockey. Um, I was really fast, though. Went into short track speed skating. Okay. Uh, put a little bit more focus into that. And then when I went over to riding, um, there was, like, a, a culture shift when I went to riding where it was, there was such a clear relationship between work put in and your performance mm. that I was like, oh, I might as well just put in as much work as I can. Mm -hmm. So that's when it, that's when I kind of switched. But as far as being like always explosive, um, I've actually become less explosive over the years. Like when I was like a uh, second year U17. So what's that, 16 years old? I was doing uh, like 1750, 1800 watts seated. Dang. Um, and what do you do now seated yeah 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 i think we're back so say that part again so, what are you doing seated now 
I don't do seated anymore. Um, but standing, I'll do like um, towards the end of the season. Um, uh, usually when I'm out of the gym, get a little bit fitter. Um, uh, the power comes down a little bit and I'm doing about 16, about 1600, 1650. Um, okay. At the very beginning of the year, February, I'll be doing like 1750. So do you think that's because you're doing more gym work earlier in the year? Or what's the reasoning behind that? I kind of like, I like to build up a little bit and then just uh, float it. Um, when you're in the season, every stage race you do, um, continuous race days, you lose peak power. Um, mm. uh, and you don't need, like I said, because bike racing is moving more towards um, harder race days. Mm -hmm. You don't actually need as high a peak anymore mm -hmm. to win. Um, um, like, uh, uh, Dainese, he won a zero stage this year. I think he, I think he peaked at like 1250. So, uh, this is actually, I'm always, I'm, I've never asked anybody this, like one second, five second, 10 or 20 second. What's most important to you or what do you pay attention to? Uh, for flat sprints, I pay closer to so the five to 10. Um, I kind of like, I'll, I'll do a sprint. And then I look at it and I go, okay, where was this sprint good? Like where, what can I, cause I, I've looked at enough of my own files that I know like, Hey, maybe this wasn't a good five second sprint. Like, like I know intrinsically, like I look at the five seconds, oh, that's, it's not very good, but it was a good 10 second sprint. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of like, sometimes I'll only sprint, like if I'm doing like a town sign sprint or I'm just sprinting for fun, it'll be like, Oh, I'll take a look at it after. I'm like, Oh, this was really good for four seconds, but I only, um, as far as a, like a benchmark for myself, I'll look at um, one to three second, usually one second, but the, the three second is important to make sure that it's a valid data point. Mm. So if you do, uh, if you, if you do a sprint and it's like 1750, 1450, 1430, that 1750 probably isn't valid because it should have, it should have a, a more rounded um, profile to the, to the sprint. That's what I was wondering. I mean, in one second, it's like you don't even go anywhere in a second. Like, I mean, and most amateurs talk like, oh, dude, I hit this. It's like, well, okay, well, what was it three seconds later? Oh, well, it was, you know, 500 watts yeah. less. Like, all right, man, well, it didn't really move you down the road that fast then. Yeah. So, okay, that's interesting. What's, you touched on gym work. Are you in the gym? Do you lift all year, part of the year at all? I usually lift off season. Okay. But I'm, I'm naturally um, strong in the gym. Mm. Um, like I'm, I'm one of those people who are like, um, you drop me in the gym almost any day of the week or any time of the year, I can back squat a hundred kilos, like 220 pounds, 225, like mm. no problem. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm in there um, more for a little bit more stability. Um, there's, there's, um, the bone density side of it, which isn't focused, but it's just something to keep in mind. Like cyclists just have notoriously poor bone density. Um, and, uh, and just to stay on top of it. Cause I'm, I'm pretty confident if I did several years out of the gym, I would start to lose that more innate ability that I have. Um, but it's mostly stabilization and just staying on top of it. It's not a big, it's not a massive focus because I, I have it naturally. Yeah. What's so a lot of pro guys always talk about volume and then they, you know, quote unquote, sprinkle in intensity here and there. If they're racing a lot, they don't feel like they have to do a ton of intensity. Does that change being a sprinter? Like what is, I think some, I, I don't really know what you do. Like, do you always sprint in every workout or how do you lay lay things out and do you work with a coach? Sorry, there's like five questions. You got me back. I, you're back. Okay. Um, so I do work with a coach, uh, men from Canada called Richard Wools. Uh, I've worked with them for like five years. Um, uh, we, uh, we do build to certain, like certain events, um, but, and like once you're in season, you don't, you don't have to train so much because racing is, mm -hmm. is difficult, but you, you do have to be aware that if you, um, uh, if you're lazy, like 
uh, for example, um, uh, some races are just easy. So, so it's, it's very common for you to go, um, let's say you, you travel Thursday, mm -hmm. pre-race ride Friday, mm -hmm. race Saturday. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon for people to go, well, I travel Thursday, so I'll just do an easy ride, travel, pre-race ride Friday, which is like an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Let's say you do a race, but it's like, like a, like a shell de press, for example, mm -hmm. but it, there's no wind. Uh, I did shoulder press this year. I think I did five hours at 180 watts. <laughs> like it was like, and then I've traveled Sunday, for example. Let's say normally you travel home the night of the race, but for sometimes you travel home Sunday. Well, you could have just done four days because, oh, you, oh, I traveled Sunday. I, I get back to my apartment at 3 p.m. I'll go for an easy ride. And you're like, okay, I just did four days, but I probably did less than 200 TSS in four days. Yeah. Like, like so you have to be careful with stuff like this. Um, sometimes you'll have three hard days or hard races in a week, and then you don't have to train at all, mm -hmm. or if you're doing a big racing block, but when you have easy races, you have to be, riders have to be aware of it so they can train. So do you, what's most of your training based around then? Like, are you doing VO2 max intervals and threshold stuff? Are you mostly riding like big volume or how does that break down? Let's say from spring through summer spring through summer so um especially if my goals are a bit later um further out from my my goals i'll be doing more uh i do uh, me and my coach do like tempo so we will be doing more tempo threshold and then as we get closer to the goals we start bringing more and more vo2 max um i do like integrating um a little bit less structured approach to my training so I'll do like, um, for example, uh, Worlds was a big goal for me um, as a U23 Worlds. This is my last year. Um, I don't know if you watched World Worlds this year. Bits and um, pieces. It was a yeah. circuit around York, uh, about around Glasgow and like really short, sharp climbs, lots of VO2 max. And instead of doing, giving me VO2 max intervals, he was just like, or like structured intervals. He just said, hey, you can go out um, ride um, for three and a half to four and a half hours and every time the road goes uphill mm. if it's less than three minutes just sit at 500 and if it's more than three minutes just do three minutes and you can shut it down and just like so sometimes I'd be like sometimes I might get 10 minutes recovery sometimes I do like a minute and a half minute and a half recovery two minutes two minutes recovery minute and a half and just like keep stepping these mm -hmm. um and while you the um, you could argue that it's not as because it's not as systematic it's not as um repeatable um as far as like like i've done this session before i'll do this session again it's not as comparable it's much more enjoyable mentally to train mm -hmm. that way um, mm -hmm. so I do a lot more intervals like that, but make a long answer longer. I do more threshold, uh, tempo when I'm a bit further away from a race. And then as I get closer, I start integrating more of these, these, uh, I mean, I think I like that though. I like that idea. And I think you could always still look at like time and zone. I think there would still be ways for your coach to compare rides, or at least for you as the athlete to know, like. I'm feeling good. I'm hitting these efforts. Like we all know when you go out for a ride, like a fart lick VO2 max ride, and you're just like, dude, I'm, I'm dead today. This is not happening. So if you're hitting it and like getting that world's prep. Yeah. I think that's, that's a great idea. And like you said, just so much fresher mentally and palatable and you can do so much more work than like staring at your power meter. And it's like, I got to do four minutes of this. And then you, you know, I like what you say. It's not systematic, but I don't, I think, I think sometimes training is getting too systematic now. Like it's so it's got to be this exact minute and watt, and it, that's just not a bike race. So it's interesting when you're doing threshold stuff, what types of stuff do you like to do? Is steady state or over unders or short long? What's kind of your bread and butter for that? To be fair, I haven't done much threshold in a while. To be fair, I don't actually spend a lot of time in like the 
So my threshold zone would be like 380 to 420-ish. Mm -hmm. um, I don't spend as much time, or now that I'm thinking about it, as I normally do. I'll spend a lot more time at like the 330 to 350 Good. longer blocks. Um, or I'll do like... When you say longer, how long? Sorry, people get... People no, love the yeah. granular. <laughs> um, let's think here. Half an hour, 45 okay. minutes. Yeah. Um, like, uh, and sometimes it'll just be like, sometimes I'll have, um, let's just quickly to threshold. Sometimes I'll do like, like uh, four and a half minutes at threshold or just under threshold, like a, um, like a tempo, mm -hmm. high tempo, low threshold, mm -hmm. 360, um, 370 surge maybe 30 second surge to 550 600 and then back and just do these uh 25 minute blocks but lots i do lots of volume in my intensity so uh i'm just thinking back i don't know when i did this session april maybe march april um and i did six by 25 minutes of a session like this so so lots i do lots of volume in my interval blocks um and then my thresholds um will usually be, um, if I have, let's say I had a, a hard day and I have a, um, I have two hard days uh, separated by a single day, but the two hard days aren't hard enough to really justify a recovery day in between. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanna keep a certain amount of load without putting too much volume. We'll throw in a longer tempo block like a two by 45 or three by 30 or something like this, that'll be like enjoyable to do. Like mentally tempo blocks are kind of fun because you, you move pretty quick. Like, yeah. yeah, they hurt, but you move pretty quick. So you're like, Hey, we can do a, we can do a three to four hour ride with a tempo block saves you from having to do a five to six. Um, so it keeps like the volume down a little bit. Um, mm. You still build load. You don't burn as many calories. Like you're not forced to eat. Um, so you should better fueled for your next, threshold and it kind of balances out that way do you ever do low cadence work or high cadence work any cadence work not really um i came from the track i used to have a high cadence uh now i pedal pretty slow um so <laughs> what's what's doing, slow to you so personally uh i've come to realize that i like a pretty consistent pressure like torque Mm, yeah, I ride well at a certain torque. So especially when I'm climbing, it's, it's climbing and training. Um, I'll be riding like, if I'm riding 280, 300 watts, I'll be riding 80 to 83 RPM. Okay. Um, but if I'm doing 400 watts, 420 watts, I'm doing like 88 to 92 RPM. Like mm -hmm. as the power goes up. And then if I'm doing VO2 maxes, 500 watts, I'll be riding 100 RPM, 102 RPM. And that's because you, that's naturally? Yeah, completely natural. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I'm focused on canes since first year junior, probably. Okay. Like hasn't been a. So do you think, what's your favorite, you mentioned that you like the tempo work because you are kind of like zooming along. What's your favorite workout that when you see it on the calendar, like, oh yes, I like this. I love a long ride. Okay. Oh, yeah. Like if I get I think, like, go ahead. If I can get six to seven, and a six to seven at like, like if I'm going out for a six to seven, and I can go out at like, like a high zone two, you know, like um. So for you, uh, that's like two eighty, two ninety. Yeah. Yeah. Two eighty. But like I'm, I'm of the opinion when everyone goes, I've just like a. Um, I don't do as much periodization as I know a lot of other people do, but they do like strict, like zone two rides, right? They do a lot of zone two. Um, I'm of the opinion that people get misconceived what zone two is and they do their zone two rides too easy. Mm. Um, Going on this. Where, like, this is, I'm liking this. Well, like, so, so this is completely personal take. So, um, this but is, the, this that, is like, Riley's hot take. This is yeah, the clip is where we clip out a reel. This is it. <laughs> okay. Um, where if you do, um, I've seen lots of people go out and they go, Oh, I do, I do strict zone two. And they're going around and they're riding it like, so my zone two uh, on training peaks is 
220 to 280, I think. Now I can go around and I ride like um, 220 all day, every day, six days a week, you know? Um, but normally when people are riding 220 everywhere, their ride averages don't be 200 because there's corners and stoplights and downhills, right? Uh, 190 even, maybe, yeah, 190. I think that if you're if you're trying to do a strict like a like a strict periodization training plan where you don't do weeks and weeks of zone two, that zone two has to be a lot higher. It doesn't have to be the very top end, like 280, yeah. but you gotta be you got to be uncomfortable in your zone two all day. On every ride? Not every ride. But for a lot of you, like if you're going out and you're like, this is a, this is a quality zone two ride, mm -hmm. you got to be doing quality endurance because like, especially if you're doing really junk zone two, like if you're going out and you're doing like almost zone one, like, like if you're, if you're doing a hundred and like f for me, if I'm on my bike, I'm doing 150 beats. For example, if I'm if I'm going out and I'm doing a, a zone two endurance ride and I'm doing 105 watt or 105 beats, like I might as well be sitting on the couch. Right. Like I'm like, what am I like? I, like active recovery is one thing, but if I'm going out and doing five hours at 180 watts, like I'll just sit on the couch and eat less food. It'll work out the same. Do you think do your European counterparts think very differently about that? Because that's something that we joke about in the state. The so I've been coached by a guy in the UK. I've been coached by American guys and. I'm 40, am I 42? Almost 42. And so people in Europe are always like, dude, you ride zone two too hard. And then it's, uh, so then we kind of call like their endurance, like Euro endurance, because they want it like 60% FTP or 55%. And it's just, it's interesting that the zone two gets all of this chatter back and forth. It's like, there's, you know, it's the basic ride, but it's not really, because everyone has a different opinion on that. Do you, do other people, are they like, dude, you're riding too hard? uh where's your coach yes, from? And sorry where's your coach my from? coach my coach is originally, originally from wales okay um but he, he lives in canada now um yes and no but here's the thing i think if you're doing quality so if your zone two rides take away from your quality like your your threshold and your vo2 you're riding zone two too hard yes. like, like if because that's like the that's like the master smasher mentality, you know? You just ride so hard every day that when you're like, I don't want to do intervals today and you just can't do them. And you're like, oh, I wonder why. But then you have a problem. So you have to look at your upcoming week. But if you have like like rest day zone or zone two ride rest day, yeah, you might as well take advantage of the zone two and the rest. Like, like you have to kind of be aware of this. Um, it is different too when like, so percentage FTP isn't applicable to all either because like um, one of my best mates is uh, Derek G. Okay. Um, that dude does heinous numbers. Um, like his, F, uh, his actual FTP is 465 <laughs> or 470. I guess 20 minutes, nearly 500. Okay. So for that dude, for that dude to ride around at 60% of his FTP is what? Like 300 watts? Yeah. Like, and that would be like, like middle of the road zone too. You're like, you just can't. Like he, he'd buckle himself, mm -hmm. right? Like he would be unable to do any training. So in the same flip of the coin that like, um, where if your FTP is only 280 watts, 60% is what 170 yeah. well that might that might not actually be your zone two because even though like the conventional cycling wisdom is your zone two is 100 or 60 percent your actual zone two might be different because uh zone two might be closer is uh like your your lactate threshold one mm -hmm. um, so you might be even though 60% is 60%, it's actually not a very accurate. The absolute number of, matters. I agree. 100%. Exactly. When, you're, when your threshold is higher, 
the numbers get all skewed and then your zones are bigger. And that's, I think it's not talked about very often, like riders with, you know, sub 300 FTPs, they, they, there's way more gray area in a zone two, three yes. ride. I mean, I coached a women where like their FTP is 170 and it's like, okay, you, yeah, you might have some surges in threshold on this ride because you're going to go over. The, uh, what's, do you ever look, do you use average power all the time or normalized power when you're doing those smash sessions or what's your, I know it's super granular and, do you, on, and no, then no. also the, the other layer of that, do you ever look at heart rate? Uh, I'm bad. I seem to have a habit of not putting on my heart rate strap much to my coach's uh, dissatisfaction, <laughs> uh, much to my coach's dissatisfaction. I don't wear my heart rate monitor anywhere near enough. Um, Normally I do it, um, I have my 10 second power running mm -hmm. and I have a 20 minute power, 20 minute rolling average, which is a much better indication because I don't want to, I don't have to worry, I don't want to worry about descents or any of that. So I'll have um, my 20 minute rolling average. So if I'm on a climb or a flat road, I can just check in and make sure it's anywhere near where I want it to be. Um, I only use, I'll use lap average or lap normalized power for longer tempo sessions. Okay. And then if I'm doing a 45 minute walk and I hit traffic or a light or a downhill, I just stop pedaling. Don't worry about the norm or the average. Um, and then once I hit the climb again, I can just start riding or flat road and it's all good. Okay. I like that. Do you, let's talk about your long ride nutrition. We'll go long ride and then we'll do race day nutrition. What's uh, you're going on for the six or seven hour ride. What are you bringing with you? Um, Haribo. <laughs> we just had uh, a Haribo. <laughs> we just had a podcast with a nutritionist from the UK and she's like all about it. And what's your favorite Haribo? Um, the cheapest one. <laughs> Usually, <laughs> like, I don't care. What's um, the cheapest one in Girona? What are you eating the most of? People want to know this. You like twin snakes? There's, no, there's the, um, the red tube with white white filling. <clears throat> Weird. I don't, I don't know. know. I, I don't know. I okay. can't tell you what it is. Yeah. Uh, Haribo makes them. So does every other no-name brand. They're pretty good. Um, All right. But I I consume enough of it. I do a rolling a rotation. So I'll put back anything. Um. I'll put between 40 and 60 grams in the bottles to start the ride. What are you putting in And there? then it'll be like um, just straight maltodextrin dextrose mix. Have you ever tried just sugar? Uh, I have tried it. Didn't work with my gut. Okay. Are you putting um, any salt in or electrolytes? No. Okay. Just go. Just go. Um, Savage. Uh, just go sugar. Because I've... Now, I don't... I don't know the accuracy of of this research but to be fair i like in training it's never really been a concern for me so i don't focus on it but like the the gut absorption of salt through sports mix is apparently pretty low mm. um to the point where um drinking um you'd have to drink so much pure pure electrolyte um mix that you could overhydrate yourself um, to the point where it's like um, so usually if I have water in the bottle, I drink to thirst. Like I don't force myself to put back bottles. Um, I'll just drink to thirst. And then if I have um, uh, mix in the bottles, I try for, in a race, I try for 120 grams of carbs per hour through mixed gels bars. Um, and then what kind of training, gels? our team sponsored by Santa Madre. So Santa Madre gels and okay. bars. Um, and then in training, um, I, I don't bother stuffing my pockets full of like an obscene amount of gummies and stuff. So instead I, um, just stop at the stop at the gas station two and a half, three hours in quick fill up. So on a six, seven hour ride, um, I'll stop twice, Okay. maybe three times, just fill up, no stress. Like you're out there long enough. A 10 minute stop isn't going to be the end of you. Mm -hmm. So multiple in the bottles and then just get more Haribo. Um, yeah, exactly. Cool. What's, what's something that you must have like friends and you're a really good sprinter. What, like what tips do you give to people that are 
trying, like, you know, if people don't practice sprinting, they're go to a race and they might be in a group of five and like, Oh, I lost a sprint. It's like, well, do you practice it? Like, well, no. What do you, what are some basic tips that you pass along to your friends or to other riders that ask you like how to get better at sprinting? Is it the actual mechanics of it? Is it finding the right gear and the feel? Like what, what have you, you know, what's, what's something you pass on to people? A nice, a nice, like an easy, the easiest tidbit is like, when you're going into the sprint, especially if you have a lead out guy in front of you, um, let, let a tiny little gap go. This good. Um, what's a good tip for people trying to get better at sprinting. And I know you're going to say, if you have a lead out, let's talk more like cat fours, cat threes who might, who probably don't even have okay. teammates. They just need to like, you know, people look awkward when they first start sprinting. And I think that's why people don't practice it. Like this feels weird. It's like, well, yeah, cause you're not used to doing it. But what are some tips that you would give like basic getting your sprint start like sprint 101, we'll say. Right. Um, all right. Uh, let's go like straight 101. Um, tightening the shoes. Like it's it sounds kind of dumb, but it actually feels makes you feel a little bit more secure um, in the drops. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not comfortable, like especially cat floors you'll see it quite a bit if when they stand up they hover over the saddle they don't like the bike doesn't feel like it looks like they're standing up just for the sake of standing up they don't know like they're not understanding like the the transfer from pedal to pedal mm. moving the bottle weight a little bit more forward and just like going out not putting any pressure like uh the best way to do it is probably going to like like a really big gear, like 50 RPM. So you're on a flat road, but really big gear. And you just stand up in the drops. Don't worry about pushing any harder and just get used to letting the bike rock underneath you. And because you're at 50 RPM, you can really feel like the, the rotate of your body over your bike. Once you get that down, then you can start looking at putting more power, start feeling the, the flow a bit better, because I think that's the biggest thing. Mm, that's interesting what's the what sort of changes have you seen in your own sprint or your own technique over the past few years and maybe well let me let's we'll leave it at that for right now i don't uh i rock my bike slightly more i still sprint with a pretty upright style like as far as like bike rock goes because i came from the track uh lots of track sprinters don't rock their bike as much as road sprinters isn't that more fit isn't that more isn't that better because you're wasting less energy and you're it's more full power into the pedals or somebody brought this up. Actually, we had a little ride camp here and they said they're focusing less on this and more of like, you're still pulling as you push, but it's like directing that power into the bike. Is that a thing? Or are we making that up? I don't know. People have been, people have been wildly successful doing both things. Yeah. Now, um, people, World-class athlete, athletes will thrive with imperfect technique. So they are not, you don't, don't look at a world-class athlete with your flaw mm -hmm. and say, well, they do it. So I'm fine. Cause that is obviously not the way to do it. Now, <laughs> if rocking the bike was so bad, anybody who rocked the bike would never win a bike race, as far as like professional bikers. Right. But I really don't think that should be your dead focus. Now, if you're rocking the bike for the sake of rocking the bike, hey, maybe think about that. Um, if you're rocking the bike and putting no force through your arms, if you're not taking advantage of having the handlebars to torque on, then maybe that's something to look at. But I don't say like, I don't want to make a blanket second saying you're rocking your bike to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I know that... I use when I fatigue, I start shifting to glute and even low back dependence. Uh, when it goes to like a 20, 22 second sprint, what this does is it brings my upper body up. This is a problem. This is something I've been focused on. The fix, keep that lower left front body down. That's really interesting that you're that dialed in that you can like feel the, I think glutes are a funny muscle that a lot of people don't even know, like what glute activation feels like. 
um, so to have that and under, did you notice yourself that you were right raising up or did your coach or teammate point that out or how did you like key into that? Uh, my coach pointed it out and it's pretty clear in photos. Mm. Um, it's pretty clear in photos from the line. Um, it's not like, I'm not like a, like I'm still doing well in sprints. Like I'm not like a, a thing of plywood, but uh, <laughs> my upper body is still a little bit, a little bit more up than I would prefer. You know, yeah. when you're, when you're fighting for, for centimeters, it's important. To look at. Yeah. So. so along with that, what else are you trying to improve on most this upcoming off season for next year? Um, that to be fair, the, the sprint is something that I'm, um, looking more to, um, just kind of maintain and stabilize. Um, I'll bring it up another few hundred or like a hundred Watts or so just through gym work. But my main focus in off season has been like, um, like, a aerobic, uh, and anaerobic, like just build, build the aerobic capacity to the point where I can train, like, Here's another hot take. A lot of people aren't even fit enough to train properly. Go in on that. What do you mean by that? So like, if you lack the aerobic capacity to do a three hour ride, for example, like, so that's, a, that's the wrong way to put it. If you lack the fitness to do a three to four hour ride, you definitely lack the, lack the aerobic capacity to do like, so if you can't do a three or four hour ride, your 20 minute is as a man, your 20 minute is probably sub 200, maybe 220, for example. I don't know, like it, I'm generalizing because the weight is a big, diff, big thing. Right. If somebody's 50 kilos, their 20 minute being 220 is pretty good. Um, if you're, if you're at that point doing 20 minutes and doing like doing intervals, if that's something you enjoy, do it. But you probably get plenty of benefit from just going out and enjoying riding your bike. Mm -hmm. Right now, this keeps going until you're like, once you get fit enough that you can like, it gets to the point where you're, you're fit enough that you can't go max. Like I remember when I was like a junior, and I could go like, I could go so deep in so many training sessions, you know, because I just lack the capacity to hurt myself properly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You could go hard when, enough to actually crush yourself. Exactly. And, and it's not just the fact that I was, because like, like, uh, I remember like local masters being like, oh, I, I remember when I was young, you know, I could, I, I would recover so fast, but I think it was more that I was just like, I'm going out and I'm doing 330 watts for 10 minutes. Like, of course I'm not hurting myself. Whereas like now, and I'm sure in two years time, I'll look back and go, fuck, I could barely hurt myself, you know? But like now, if I go out and I proper smash myself, I'm like, hey coach, I need to take like two, maybe three days off. And you'll be like, you're an idiot. Like, why did you go all that far? Yeah. You know? Like you just, like you're, like the adaptations you'll get from doing a single hard day and then forcing yourself to take two or three days off or two or three days easy because mm -hmm. you did too much damage. You just know when you the adaptations you'll get from doing repeated easier days back to back. Mm -hmm. Consistency is king. Yeah. So when you say building aerobic capacity, did your brain go towards the doing more endurance or are you thinking of your VO2 max intervals or is that both together? I won't do so much VO2 max intervals um, in in January or in like like November, December, January. Mm -hmm. January, it'll depend on my race season. There's a possibility I'll be doing a hell of a lot of VO2 max intervals in January. But November for sure, it'll be a lot of like like high zone two mm -hmm. rides, um, 250 to 280. When, when I'm riding, you know, like yeah. if, if I'm, let's say I'm in Andorra or I'm riding in the mountains, the ride might only be 210 average, but I've descended for an hour and a half of that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and a lot more tempo threshold type work. Mm. When you're going to build the anaerobic capacity, what types of workouts do you like for that? Like just 60 second bangers or shorter, longer, a mixture? Or do you have like 
time and zone that you go after? How do you look at those? Um, a mixture. Yeah. I do a lot of 30 second maxes in uh, preseason, but that more goes towards building the sprint. And the, the 30 second maxes um, are 30 seconds to one minute is the area where I can do the most damage to myself. So doing them in November, December is okay because I'm not looking for too much quality in like my zone two rides. Mm. So I can get away with, I can get away with doing a really hard um, anaerobic session, mm -hmm. like almost, almost uh, um, ATP, like, like using up full stores. And then, yeah, I'm like, broken for my zone two ride, but okay. I can only do 240 instead of 260. It's like, Oh, whatever, you know, mm. like that's okay. Um, and those 30 second, one minute might be like, I'll start the season doing like four by 30 seconds with maximum recovery, like 20 minutes. And then I might build up to like six by one minutes or, and those are two, those are two different training. Yeah. But, moving on like six to eight by effort. Okay. What's um, so if you're going out and doing mega damage, do you use any supplements or anything to help recover or what's your recovery protocol? Sleep. Mostly. Like how much, how much do you sleep on a good night? What's a good night for Riley? And nine hours is almost consistent. A good nine hours, but like, I love a good nap. I love a good hour, hour and a half nap. So I'd yeah. say like for 24 hours, I might be getting 10 hours. Let's just say 10 hours is sick. Um, 10 hours of sleep a day. Okay. Um, it's pretty consistent. So you've given some hot takes. What's uh, underrated in training or cycling in general? Hmm. I like... Okay, I consider myself a pretty introverted person, but if you have a good training partner, even if you have two different, like even if you have dinner, different intervals, if you can commute to where you want to do intervals, do your individual intervals and then commute home together, the mm -hmm. intervals themselves will be much powerful. Even if you never see the person during the intervals, just knowing that they're on the same climb as you, will actually give you a lot better workout. I like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Who, who is your, do you have a couple of ride buds there? Teammates or just people that you live with or? Uh, I almost exclusively ride with Derek actually. Just like we're just good mates. Um, uh, I'll ride with uh, Joe Laverick. Um, okay. Who's a housemate. And yeah, I'll ride with, with uh, you know, a couple teammates or, whatever, but that would be like once every two weeks or so. Okay. Um, I'd say like five days a week, I end up running with Derek. That's awesome. Yeah. R ride buds make uh, not only the long endurance rides, but it's the interval sessions. I think that's a good, you just, you almost feel like somebody's with you, as you said, even though they're not yeah. there, you're like someone's kind of watching or like, or motivating you or, you know, they're going hard. It just, yeah, it changes the vibe of it for sure. Yeah. What? What's uh, have you ever done anything in training that you feel like has slowed you down at all? Like in the long run, like uh, like yeah, or then you look back, you're like, oh, you know, that just didn't work for me, or that's not for me, or maybe you like train too much, or just something that like it just it didn't add to you as an athlete. I've been lucky in a couple senses. Um, one because I've been like I've I found a coach early who clicked with me mm. being rich. So I've been, I've been with him for five years now. And two, I'm young enough that almost any stimulus will work mm. because I'm under trained, you know, like once you hit, like, like I'm sure in a couple of years, it'll get to the point where I'm like, Hey, I'm still doing these efforts and they're doing shit. All. But at the moment, um, they're, um, the stimulus is like still working. That being said, I don't repeat workouts. Like there's not like a, Hey, this is my bread and butter work. Mm. Right. The workouts I've changed 
the type of intervals I'm doing so much that like, yeah, okay, there's still, I'm still doing three minute blocks. I'm still doing two minute blocks. I'm still doing one minute blocks, but like the, the recovery, the intensity, and it's not uncommon for me to change up. Like, like I'll be doing, okay, what's the session? I was doing like a six, six by four minute session, but I started five, I uh, started 450, I think. Yeah, it would be like 450 for the first minute, 480, uh, 520, 560 for a So every minute is set up. And then maybe the next time I'm doing a similar session, it'll be more like do 470 for four, uh, for 345 or 340 and then a 20 second max. Mm -hmm. And then the next time I'm doing, so yes, they're all a type of VO2 max intervals, but they're changing constantly. Mm -hmm. Does that, do you, how do you gauge? See, cause I kind of like that style. I know some athletes are like, well, I want to be able to compare Watts. And it's like, well, I, I don't necessarily agree with that all the time because you know, some days you're just stronger than others. So just because you did something in week one and you don't do it as high of Watts in week two, it's not a failed session or a wasted session. Or like, I think you need to look at each session individually sometimes, but progression is like people like you got to progress you got to progress i don't know how do you view that or how do you know what's your why does that resonate with you that style i really like the diversity of it um as far as like managing acknowledgement of progression um i am very focused on numbers not not just on the bike but off the bike like um my roommate uh joe he says i spend more time on strava than anybody knows like mm -hmm. i'm constantly look at everyone's training like i break down everything um just because it's like like i'm not i'm not judging the person obviously i just really like being like hey this was a good day hey look he did this training plan whatever because of that i spent so much time looking at not just other people's training of course my own training that like, I know that like, if I'm doing 5.30 for four minutes, that's a good session, mm. okay? If I'm doing, if I do five five oh five, but I did this 3.40 and then a sprint, I go, hey, I'm doing a sprint at the end. Like, like you should be able to be like, hey, that's still a pretty good session. Like, yeah, I was doing 25 watts less, but I'm like, that's still like, like given how much you lose, like given how inefficient doing a sprint is as far as your average power goes, mm -hmm. instead of just doing a steady effort, you should be able to, to be aware that like, hey, this was actually, I was pretty happy with this session. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing, if I'm doing four, like you can also break it down individually as well and say, I did 480 for three minutes, 40. Well, that was an RPE of, eight for example well i go hold on a minute 480 for four minutes is usually an rpe of eight and a half so i go hey that's you know like if it's an rpe of eight yeah okay it's 20 seconds shorter but i'm like hey i must have been run pretty well so if i just ignore this completely i can still look at that file as a steady state yeah mm -hmm. no i like that it's uh yeah you're definitely into the numbers into the training which i think though you at the same time are able to step back and see the big picture and how that applies to you as an athlete. And that's, I think going to resonate with a lot of people because, because of power meters, we are all, I shouldn't say all many people are just a little bit too into it sometimes. And it can become, you know, like, Oh, I missed this by five Watts. Like I totally suck today. It's like, dude, I mean, <laughs> come on. So <clears throat> our RPE, you, do you use that very often? Um, that's like, you sound pretty keyed into that. And I think that's something before where you said, Hey, like I'm recovering better. That's not always acknowledged by athletes like this. Oh, I might've done the same efforts, but man, I felt way better in the recovery period between how do you do you like really key into that? I, I don't, I don't normally put numbers to it because it's such a intrinsic feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, I understand that if you're, if you're new, like if you're new to you, to acknowledging RP, it might be easier because um, you're, you forget how unfortunate efforts are. So if you do an effort last week and then you do an effort this week, 
and this week they feel really bad, you might forget that last week also felt just as bad because you've like blocked out those negative memories, for example. Um, so putting a number to it and you go last week, I remember saying it was an eight and this week's a 7.5. So even though this feels worse, it doesn't feel like an eight. So I know it's better. For me, I look at, there's more of like an intrinsic feeling of knowing like this feels like 350. This feels like 400. And it's not uncommon for me to get efforts where it's like 400 watts on feel. And all I mean is, all it means is like, go out and do what 400 watts should feel like. Mm. Okay. And then I go out and I'll check in at minute five or minute 10 at my average. And I'll be like, check in. And if it's 380 or if it's 410, I don't give a shit. But if it's 340, because I'm calling it a day, like clearly, <laughs> clearly my RP is misrepresenting how difficult this is. And if this is how hard 340 feels, this isn't a quality work day. So I, I met her off calling it, taking it easy and doing this session when I'm riding better. Mm -hmm. That's good. I like that. My last question, what's the best way for people to keep up with you this uh, upcoming year? Instagram, do you blog, Twitter, anything like that? Strava is actually probably my best way. Um, <laughs> I'm not as active on social media as I should be. Uh, Instagram, uh, Instagram, the three I use the most would be uh, Strava, Instagram, and Twitter, probably. Um, all with my name, Riley Pickerel. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, Strava is definitely used the most. Um, it's also the least um, uh, professional of my social medias, for sure. Um, just because like I'll post photos of um, uh, from my rides, photos and videos of my rides, and they're just they're just for fun, you know. So um, that's probably the the best way to see like a personal side. Uh, no, I like that acknowledgement because that's the unfiltered stuff. Whereas the Instagram has to be more like for the sponsor and for you, you probably, I, I think as users, we think differently about our post ride photos and then like, well, okay, what am I going to post on Instagram? It's just, yeah, it's less authentic maybe. And um, no, it's awesome, man. Thank you so much for doing this. This is a ton of insights and gems and I was really pumped to talk to you and wishing you the best of luck next year. That's a huge step up and super stoked for you. And we'll be looking for some big results. And um, thank you again for doing this. Any parting words for the people? I know I had sent over a bunch of different topics. Anything that we missed that you were like, oh, I really wanted to hit on that? No. Um, let me just have a quick 10 second thing. Uh, every once in a while, I'll do, I'll do like, a, like in season. But let's say I have like, uh, like a weekend without racing mm -hmm. and I want to get like a, like a, a race day kind of stimulus in there. Mm. I'll do some heinous rides. So if you're following me on Strava, you might be able to check in on some of those. Um, for example, I did a ride where I had to do, um, it was like six hours or something, six and a half hours. And it was, it worked out to being, uh, a three minute effort every 15 minutes for the entire six hours. It was like 17 efforts at over seven watts per kilo every single effort. so it was like 510 watts for every single effort just heinous just heinous stuff which well, that's like, 12 minutes times six god dude it's like 40 <laughs> what was it like 48 48 minutes i think at 500 watts or above yeah i came with gnarly yeah don't but, don't yeah. don't go with riley on that bike ride <laughs> unless you want to die yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, those are kind of fun, but they don't happen all that often. Yeah. It seems like you like that though. You like the pain. I, 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 I like doing epics. I like doing, I like doing like during COVID, I did a 550, 550 kilometers. What's that? 320 miles. But I went out and I just smashed didn't, it. It was like, didn't sleep, no sleep, brought lights, just no sleep. Started at 9 p.m. So I went through the night first and was like two, like two thirty average, two thirty five average for like 16 hours or 17 hours or something like this. Dude. So you're going to try and like beat Lachlan and all the things he's doing. No, I was just like, 
my buddy, we did, it was a point to point. We broke from my buddy's house to my house. Was this in We're Canada like, or was this down in outside in, of Girona? In Canada. Okay. In Canada. So we rode from Kelowna to Victoria, if anybody knows Canada. It was about 550K. Had about 200K of gravel. Dude, that's wild. People so, will be looking for that on Strava now, so don't let them down. All right. They can <laughs> they can go find it. They can comment if they find it. I'll see everybody if follow, follow Riley. Comment <laughs> on his rides. Give him some kudos. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you guys soon.